There is no audio other than my voice. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, once we get started here, I'll pull the link and we'll put that in the chat box and that'll give you access to the slides so you can follow along with us. The webcast is being recorded and we'll make sure that we send you a link to the recording next week. And sometimes we get way more questions than we have a chance to answer. If that's the case, we'll be sure to pull those out, share them with our presenters, and then get responses back to you. So again, this is the WCT webcast, Redefining Liberal Arts in the Future of Higher Education and STEM Education. So as we go through, if you have any questions at all, enter them into the Q&A box. You can also use the chat box. Again, you can access the link to the PowerPoint as soon as I have a chance to drop that in the chat. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel and that hashtag is WCET webcast. So as we are ready to get started, I'll introduce myself. I'm Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs here at WCET. And if you're not familiar with WCET, be sure to go on our website. We have lots of resources and um, you can access all of our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check us out. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box. We'll hold questions toward the end unless we feel the need to answer a question during the presentation, but please keep the, the questions going. Today, I'm also your moderator, and my Twitter handle is Emmy Raymond. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today, and I'm very thrilled to have them do brief self-introductions. I'll go ahead and list their names, and then we'll start with introductions. So Michael Horn, is an author and formerly with the Clayton Christensen Institute. Anne is the CEO of Adjacent Ac Academies and Alexandra is a student. She's in her senior year at Davidson College. So Michael, go ahead and do an introduction. Terrific, thanks so much. Uh, well, I, cur currently I'm the uh, head of strategy for the Entangled Group and uh, co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute and, uh, and the author uh, of the new book, uh, Choosing College, uh, which gets into some of the issues that we'll be talking about today. So thrilled to be with you. And uh, Megan, you want me to jump into my, what, what, I would, what I would have been? Sure, sure. I do like to ask our presenters, if they weren't in the space of higher ed, ed tech, what they would be doing otherwise. So Michael, what would your answer be? Sorry, sorry to preempt you on that, uh, but, I, but it's been on my mind. I, I, I would be a jazz pianist. That's what I would be. Fascinating. And are you musically talented and trained? I, 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 I am a pianist. I just I, I made the decision at some point from my liberal arts background that uh, piano is not the way to uh, earn a living wage in the long term. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I pivoted to education. Great. And go ahead and do your intro and tell us what you would be doing if you weren't in this fabulous space of ed tech. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today and thanks to all the co-hosts. Uh, as Megan mentioned, I'm the CEO of Adjacent Academies and my background is largely in education, education technology and HR tech. Uh, right before joining Adjacent, I was at a company called Coru, which helped focus on soft skills development and assessment uh, for large-scale companies, and then prior to that, spent a decade at the Gates Foundation in both the K-12 and higher ed teams. So as you can hear, a lot of interest and passion, like Michael, around education and around opportunity. If I weren't doing that, and I feel really grateful to have the opportunity to do that full-time, I would be a full-time Little League softball coach. <laughs> Anne told me that earlier, and I, I admire her passion and her patience to do something like that. And Alexander, if you weren't pursuing the degree that you were doing and weren't in your senior year at college, what would you be doing? Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra. Um, I'm an environmental studies senior at Davidson College. Um, if I weren't pursuing environmental studies, I would be doing culinary school, I think. Fantastic. And clearly, we all have some liberal arts passions. So to be fair, I would answer the question as a park ranger, and I was telling Ann that as I've gotten older, I've become more fair weather, so it would be a fair weather, likely part-time park ranger, but that would give me the ability to get out and make sure that I'm sharing the love of our trails and open spaces. So, Ann, why don't you go ahead and get started with framing the conversation we're gonna have today? Sounds good. Um, before we dive into the content, we just wanted to make sure we're clear on what we want everyone to get out of today's conversation. So we hope you'll walk away with at least three things. One is an understanding about some of the skills and opportunities that are really defining um, the future for graduates of liberal arts institutions and studies. 
The second is a student perspective. This is where Ale comes in um, about how students are thinking about accessing opportunity in an ever-changing world. And then the third is some ideas about how institutions are integrating humanities with science and technology learning. Um, so at large, hopefully we'll walk away with those three things, hopefully a lot more, and feel free to post questions in the chat. Uh, we'll try to address them at the end, and if there are some burning ones, we'll pause uh, throughout to answer. Thank you. So we always like to start a bit with what the opportunities is for students after um, they go to school. And we hear a lot, as you know, around the jobs that are highest demand, that we hear that they really bucket into two categories. There's a lot of conversation around jobs and opportunities related to healthcare, as you can see, uh, around medical technology, around RNs, but also there's a large category of jobs that you'll read around, about that relate to analytics and technology. So things like being a web developer, things like being a data scientist. And the question is, are those truly the jobs that are, are highest in demand? And the spoiler alert is that they're not. That in fact, what we see from a lot of research in the field uh, and work with employers is that the jobs that are in the most demand are called hybrid jobs. And that may be something that, a term that's familiar to you, uh, but conceptually, what we mean um, is that the basics of hybrid jobs are there are ones that don't just require one set of skills. Uh, Megan, next slide. Is that they really require a balance. So it's the ability to have not just technical knowledge, um, but also the ability to integrate non-technical skills and ways of thinking. And that those types of jobs, those blended jobs, are in fact the ones that are growing much more rapidly in the economy. Uh, we all know that the jobs of today, we can't even predict if those jobs will exist tomorrow or even what they'll be called, in fact. And that those jobs uh, that require a broader skill set um, are not only growing more quickly, um, they're more likely to resist automation. And from an equity and opportunity perspective, they are uh, likely to be jobs that result in a higher wage. Um, Michael, I'm curious in your work with institutions uh, and with students, does this language uh, come to bear in those conversations? It could be that they talk about hybrid jobs, it could be they call it something else, but how, how do you see this coming up? Yeah, it's interesting in our, in our book, Choosing College, where we, we got to create basically 200 mini documentaries of students choosing college and how they frame these questions and then the experience itself during college, right? Uh, what's so interesting is that students, particularly in this day and age, they don't really know what the labor market is like. They haven't held jobs when they were in high school, and so they don't have a clear sense. And so my sort of take on it is we see these hybrid jobs growing and in importance, and it's the responsibility really of institutions to intentionally curate and create these opportunities and expose students to a range of fields, frankly, so that they can start to understand what these new roles that are emerging in the economy are, because otherwise they don't have a point of basis for, for even understanding where they could or should go. And it's really the responsibility of institutions to surface the opportunities. The second thing really quickly is that we also see from the research that specializing too early actually can be quite dangerous uh, for students because it can send you down a uh, particular career path that might not be there in the future or might not actually match your passions once you get a much clearer sense of what you like and don't like from knowing what's out there. And so not only is it important to curate these pathways uh, into hybrid jobs intentionally, it's also important for students for their later success to be able to navigate and succeed uh, in a way that matches their ultimate passions. Great, so I think I hear from you, Michael, this idea that um, sometimes we hear that it's important to specialize early, that students will, as a result, you know, people talk about the T, you know, be a generalist, but then develop a deep spike. And that in so doing that, um, students are able to become expert more quickly. And I think you're saying that there's some risk associated with that, uh, particularly in an economy that is changing rapidly um, and where the skill sets are and the platforms that people are applying those skills to are, are always changing. And so as we think about you know, what the soft skills are, and soft skills is one word for them. I think we hear them called other things. So we've heard essential skills or some um, institutions call them the non-perishable skills, the skills that will really endure um, despite what uh, specific technologies exist. 
Um, and you can see some of those here, but they're the ability to think creatively and problem solve quite differently. The ability to collaborate in diverse teams, uh, to find new solutions, to adapt, to manage time, to, to manage ambiguity really well. And those are things that um, we know from an employer perspective, we hear that the majority of employers say that those in fact are, are what's most important and that the ability, if somebody has those things, then they're more likely to be able to train them on the quote technical skills, that it's actually harder uh, to skill people up on these types of skills. Um, the next slide shares a little bit about some of the the technical skills um, that are emerging, and some of this re research comes out of Burning Glass, around skills such as uh, computing, AI, da data analytics, et cetera. Um, Megan, next slide. And so, but what's interesting to see is that it's not necessarily, again, this bright line between these enduring essential skills and these hard skills, that in fact, they are, they're coming together. Um, over time. And I think, Michael, this is also something that you're seeing in your research. Could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, totally. And, and, and I think the, the phrase that you used is right, which is that the bright line between these is really disappearing. And what we're seeing is that in, in what uh, economists would call sort of a kind environment where it's very predictable and, and so forth, deep specialization, incredibly important. And some of those soft skills may be less important, like just digging in and building the fact base. But we're in, in a world right now that's incredibly interdependent, unpredictable, uh, changing rapidly. And what we're seeing is that innovation actually comes from the combining of different areas. Um, and uh, creativity is, in fact, a function of coming at things from different perspectives. And so if you're just too laser focused on one of these hard skills, say, you're going to miss the opportunities in intersection to really develop that creativity. And so you know, many of these soft skills obviously have generalizable components, but they really come to bear when you can bring a number of disciplines together uh, within some domain knowledge as well to exercise, say, critical thinking or other skills that weren't necessarily on that first slide. But really where the magic of all this comes together is in the intersection of bringing lots of disciplines together. I think that's right. And I think certainly something we found um, at, at Koru where I was last is that, and, and at Adjacent actually, is that those essential skills, those power skills are really taught in context. It's not like you can sit someone down and say, okay, now we're going to do a session on teamwork. And now we're going to do a session about thinking about deep impact, right? You actually have to be um, in the process of solving something with other people in order to be able to practice, get feedback on, and then uh, iterate really quickly your opportunity to build that skill and that um, the environments that offer students, adults, et cetera, the opportunity to really dig deep um, and problem solve live time are the ones where we likely see the most acceleration in those types of essential skills uh, alongside some of the technical skills. And I think too, if you think about the types of companies uh, and the problems and the questions that are being solved. So the next slide, there's three examples here, um, Pinterest, OpenTable, and Uber, that you know, everyone thinks of these companies as tech companies, right? I mean, they, they technically live in that space. But at the end of the day, the problems that they are trying to solve are human problems. They're, they're about human behavior. They're trying to understand how people create communities. They're trying to understand people's patterns of behavior when it comes to eating out, why they eat out, the type of communities like to form while they're doing that. Um, they're trying to understand how people travel and, and uh, you know, what their patterns of transport look like. And that it doesn't require just having an engineer uh, to answer these questions. So you know, with OpenTable, it's an engineer alongside someone who maybe has an anthropology background and can sit and observe people dining. Um, but at the end of the day, there are these really big questions uh, that in fact really require the ability to think creatively and think critically and then uh, create an idea that can then be implemented in some sort of technical way. So as we think about the liberal arts, and we're all here, I think, uh, because we have a, a lot of respect for the, the liberal arts, um, and think uh, that the students who come from a humanities background have a lot to contribute. Um, and that in fact, those students are really prepared uh, because they have a very strong foundation. They're able to think critically, um, they're able to analyze not within their own discipline, but across multiple contexts. And a lot of the liberal arts is about pattern recognition. It's about being able to see something, ask a set of informed questions about it, uh, dig more deeply, and then make connections to really think innovatively about how you address that. 
And, you know, we would say that, uh, you know, some people talk about reinventing the liberal arts. You know, I, I would say that the liberal arts adds a lot of value. It, it's not, um, you know, it's, it, it's not about replacing the liberal arts. It's about sort of augmenting the opportunity that students have. And so we've talked a little bit about the skills and the opportunities and how these hybrid skills come together in new opportunities going forward. And I think it'd be great to talk specifically now about students. The second point we want to talk about, which is how are students thinking about this? You know, sometimes um, adults come in the room and they say, oh, well, students are studying humanities and they don't really know that there's this bigger world around them. And I actually don't, just don't think that's true. Um, I think that many students who are in liberal arts and humanities, they are really thinking about what lies ahead for them. And so Maya is a student that we were able to work with last summer who chose uh, very intentionally to go to a liberal arts education. She's at Scripps studying art. She really wanted a diverse education. She also knew that she didn't want to be constrained to galleries and knew that the scale of impact with technology is broader. So she chose a digital art major. And she didn't feel comfortable taking technical courses on campus because she didn't see people uh, like her in those courses. She said, I wanted to become proficient in technology with people who have a similar level of proficiency, but also have a similar aspiration. You know, I, I, she said, I don't want to be a developer at Google. Um, I think there's probably other things I can do. And she walked away from her experience uh, being really motivated around design and around UI UX. Um, another student has a slightly different story, Alex on the next slide. Uh, he, like Ali, is at Davidson. Um, and he has always had a motivation around technology, um, but he feels like he wanted an opportunity where he said, quote, he wanted an whole, a holistic approach to learning technology in a way that kept other people in mind and kept really the societal impact perspective. Um, and so he wanted to surround himself with people who wanted to think not just about the technical skills, but also that balance of um, soft skills, societal impact, and bring that to bear. Uh, and today we have Ale, who, as you heard, she's a senior at Davidson. Um, she just made it past her capstone project, which was really intense. She's really excited to be past that in senior spring. Super exciting. Um, and I'd love to ask Ale a few questions. Uh, and get your, your thoughts on how you think about your education and how you think about carrying that forward um, into the impact that you want to have. Uh, first, really simple question is, we see that you're an environmental studies and philosophy major. How did you choose your major? Yeah, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I chose environmental studies because before coming to Davidson, I had a really big interest in sustainability, but I didn't really know what that looks like. And I chose a liberal arts education because it lets you go into school without knowing what exactly you want to do. And they kind of encourage you to um, try out different courses and majors. Um, and so I went in, took a lot of different courses, found myself still gravit gravitating to environmental studies. Um, and I chose the social science track because it let me look at things from the sociological perspective, anthropological perspective, economics perspective. Um, so I ended up majoring in that and I was really passionate about sort of like the reasoning and ethics part of answering big sustainability topics. Um, so I became a philosophy minor as well. Great. So it sounds like you had this real interest in different thinking about uh, different questions, right? And applying your thinking in different contexts. Did you, uh, I know you eventually developed a curiosity around technology. Uh, is that something that's always been a curiosity? Uh, did you feel like something was missing um, and so you're trying to fill a hole like tell us a little bit more about that yeah so i did not have any interest um in anything technical at first uh but in my junior year once i started looking into inter internship postings and looking at positions where i envisioned myself at in the future and that i was really passionate about i saw that having some sort of technical skill was a bonus and something that i was lacking so I knew I had to sort of work on that. And I knew that I was really prepared for these positions in the first place because of my education at Davidson um, and the whole interdisciplinary approach. I was just missing that one aspect. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take um, a data science course. And it gave me a bit more of technical ability because I learned R, but I still felt like I needed something else. So I applied to adjacent because they really, um, 
spoke about being tech curious and that's what I define myself as. So um, I went ahead and did that. I obviously know how that went, but um, how I'm curious, why uh, not take more data science or uh, computer science classes on campus? Yeah, so I had seen those courses um, and sometimes I add, actually added it to my course load, mm -hmm. but the first week during syllabus week, I saw it was all computer science majors, all STEM majors, and I didn't, one, feel comfortable, or two, I didn't really feel confident in that space because I had no background. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very competitive atmosphere, and that wasn't something that I felt comfortable doing and didn't really feel like, I felt like everyone had a lot more experience than me, um, so I ended up dropping those courses. Got it. So you dropped those courses because they potentially just weren't a good fit for you at that time. Um, you did adjacent, which is a sort of immersive study uh, away experience. And now on the other side of that, um, you know, what are, how, how did that affect you? You know, what are you thinking of doing? Has anything changed about how you think about uh, technical skills or technical opportunities? Yeah. So um, after adjacent, I realized that if I, actually wanted to become a UX designer or programmer, I could because I learned JavaScript and CSS in a very short period of time. And not only did I learn those languages, but it gave me the tools to learn how to learn any other language or any sort of technical skill that I wanted to learn. Um, and it also gave me the confidence to apply to the jobs where I would eventually need those skills, even if I didn't have that. Um, ability necessarily, like a specific tool or language, I knew that I could still do it and teach myself. Um, and just gave me the ability to keep learning about technical skills that um, I was interested in. Great, well, thanks for that. Michael, do you have any questions for Ali? Actually, while we have a minute. Sure thing, yeah, I, I'm just curious as, as sort of something that's come up is, is how employers understand these credentials um, and how you translate what you've learned from both the liberal arts and the technical skills in, in having those conversations. And I'm, I'm just curious to hear how that experience has been. I'm sorry to clarify. So through the interview process with employers? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the positions that I've been applying for aren't necessarily for something in the tech field, but they always talk about if I have some, they ask me if I have some sort of like confidence in that. Um, and it seems like it's been a plus during my interview process. Um, I tell them that, you know, so I'm looking at a lot of sustainability analyst roles and in sustainability analysis, it's kind of a new role, but they do use a lot of um, programming languages like R, SQL, um, and tools like Icon, which are, for example, Icon is a tool that I took on to use um, for my capstone last semester, and I didn't know how to use the tool, but um, talking to my school, they were able to purchase it, and I was able to teach myself how to use it, and a lot of employers that I've talked to, they're like, wow, you know, people don't know how to use that coming out of college, still being an undergraduate student, um, and for example, I've talked to someone who said you would need SQL, and I told them, well, I don't know SQL, but I did do the six-week program where I was able to learn JavaScript and CSS in four weeks, and I feel confident in teaching myself that, and I do have some background with R. So it's just more like the confidence in being able to do it and saying that I have the skills to teach myself um, at an entry-level position, and rather than being a computer science major who knows how to do everything it's more it's kind of how I frame it that it's not my specialty but I can do it I think it's interesting you say that Ali because there's this question in the chat around articulating um, quote soft skills to employers and I think when you're you're in school and you know you're the way that most institutions are structured they're around disciplines right and so you think about I'm a history major, I know history, or I'm an English major, I, I know English, I know how to write. Um, and there's an opportunity, you know, I, I call it like the decoder ring. It's like, how do you, the secret decoder ring between what you majored in and the world of work. Um, and there's an opportunity in certain types of environments to help kind of translate, sure, you may know 
history. Um, but really what it is, is that ability to, to analyze a lot of information, form opinions, et cetera. Or for what you're talking about, Ali, is this, it's not necessarily that, you know, sustainability. And the thing that you communicated with the, in that interview that you referenced is that you have this different way of thinking um, and you have the ability uh, to take on a new language and figure it out. And so, so the more that I think we can give students the opportunity to immerse themselves in experiences that help them or force them out of the discipline uh, and, you know, either are interdisciplinary or are really more focused on um, the skill they're actually using uh, to answer a problem as opposed to the problem self, the, the, the more value there is there. Yeah, definitely, because that technical skill is not what they're looking for. We're, they're usually still looking for sustainability, all of these courses that I've taken in sociology, political science, but I'm able to add this other layer of like, okay, but I can get into the nitty gritty and like use data analytics to help answer these questions while still having this big systems thinking approach that I developed in college. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you for sharing um, your perspective and we wish you the best of luck uh, and can't wait to see what you do with everything. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Ali. Um, so we've had a chance to talk a little bit about skills, um, a little bit about the student perspective, and we'd love to shift gears and spend a little bit of time talking about uh, how institutions and some ideas about how institutions are giving students these different opportunities. Um, and the value of this is not just to the students, but you know, overall, as we think about enabling more uh, students and graduates to have this blend of skills um, that there's not just higher job placement, uh, but also reducing poverty. And you know, the thing I think that's not here is maybe more of a, you know, an ethical moral question of, you know, as we move into a world that is extremely tech and innovation driven, there are, is certainly critique um, around uh, leaders that are pure tech. Uh, actually yesterday's Inside Higher Ed, there was an interesting article um, by a woman who has sort of been on the side of STEM education and CS and saying now that she feels that it's actually, um, that you can go too far um, and that there's real value and more value in having leaders uh, who have not just the ability to think technically and can ask those questions, but come from the perspective of the ethics and values um, and making decisions that really, uh, good decisions that will affect society differently and not just thinking about um, the tools. At Adjacent, we talk a lot about, you know, we want the students coming out of Adjacent to be really technically capable, um, but we would be doing them a disservice if they felt that technology lacked values and didn't express values. Um, so if you come out really great at writing a line of code, but you have no sense of uh, any bias you might uh, be pulling forward in a product that you make or any negative impact that you have on a community, that we actually haven't done a good job. Um, and so this idea that it's a win-win, not just for students and institutions, but at large, it's, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. So there are a handful of uh, institutions um, that are doing a number of things to help students um, try on different opportunities and develop a different set of skills. Uh, and so what we'd like to do here uh, is to walk through a couple of ideas, share a little bit of the research base around it, and then um, talk specifically about what the institutions are doing. We wanted to kind of flag them for you. We're not going to go into detail on what they're doing, uh, but just wanted to highlight them here. Um, so the first general idea is the opportunity for students to try on related careers that fit their interests. This is, isn't a new idea. Um, but certainly there are more institutions that are doing this in a real authentic way, um, giving students the opportunity to try things on in a low risk way. Uh, I think sometimes students, particularly those who are high achieving, feel that um, taking one step, if it's not a perfect step, is a bad step. And so the question is, how are universities offering career advising and internships that give them a chance to try things on and they can decide whether or not that's something they want to continue trying on or try something else on. Um, Michael, what are you seeing with respect to this idea? Yeah, I, you know, there's a fair amount of research on this question that's really come to light in the last several years. There's uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, professor Robert Miller uh, in economics and statistics that basically shows 
uh, that when you're thinking about career matching, getting a lot of reps in in a lot of different fields is extraordinarily important. Uh, uh, he has a slot machine analogy of sort of playing many slot machines and, and, and figuring out uh, which one has the greatest probability for you to be successful is extraordinarily important. There's also a lot of research from Todd Rose in the book Dark Horse, uh, David Epstein and Range, uh, that shows that uh, that people who are the most successful in their field uh, actually, on average, tend to come from unpredictable backgrounds that see them wander a little bit in their 20s uh, before they sort of find their place. And so giving people uh, opportunities to try on related careers that fit their interests is extraordinarily important. And if you get people too quickly on a narrow track, you actually sort of cut off this exploration process that may be important to their future success. Yeah, so the one institution that has done this really well um, is uh, UT Arlington, where they are, I think a common thread that you'll see in these examples is they are uh, trying to enable sort of the interdisciplinary travel. Um, and so it's this idea of the art and art history departments really thinking about um, really applied concentrations, uh, whether it be in packaging or a degree in music, where um, they're able to take classes in the business school uh, and then have internships and alumni lined up um, to help them actually go and do those either short form or long term. Um, so that's one specific example. Uh, I think the second idea is, um, Megan, we click ahead, is uh, the actual idea of applied learning and Northeastern is obviously a very well known example here uh, because of the co-op model where students are able to um, actually work as a part of their education. And Michael, I'm curious if there are other uh, examples here in the research you see here around sort of concurrent um, application of learning uh, in addition to, to the education. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the greatest examples out there right now is at College Unbound, uh, you know, super innovative experiment out of uh, Providence where the curriculum is essentially rooted in the actual work and experiences you have on a day-to-day -day basis. And it sort of speaks to what Stephen Koslin, uh, who was the founding academic dean at Minerva and now Foundry, former Harvard professor, has written about uh, that engagement uh, by students is the number one uh, factor in whether they actually learn, right? You have to engage them and get them in an active learning experience. Um, and then secondly, it's also important, obviously, uh, transferring the learning from the classroom to real life. And that's what Northeastern obviously has done so well is make those connections explicit over time. Uh, but but uh, there's sort of a dual purpose to applying what you're doing uh, in the classroom to real practical problems that, that are facing. Uh, and also engaging, frankly, the generation that's coming in that want to tackle messy societal problems in many cases. Yeah, yeah I think College about Unbound is a really um, interesting model and I think um, there's always obvious, obviously some challenges and they have the opportunity of a flexible structure right that enables them to, to operate that way and I think more institutions are figuring out you know how do we in the context of a um, more traditional academic calendar um, in space how do we create spaces for that whether it's semester away or uh, summer study um, the third idea we wanted to highlight is around more collaboration across departments. So uh, here, you know, Adjacent's been an interesting example of this. We work really closely with Davidson College and have been incredibly impressed uh, with the faculty, not just in the CS department where we're um, developing some technical courses, but also the collaboration with the English department. So um, one of the courses in the study way experiences around science fiction and technology, which is a space to enable students to really wrestle with the morals and ethics of tech. Um, and so it's really been really awesome to see uh, the English faculty really engage with the CS faculty um, in not just picking the topics, but exploring the really present examples of that in technology to um, offer students a space to discuss that. Um, Michael, where are you seeing this come up? Yeah, you know, companies like 3M, for example, actually see that the majority of their patents that they uh, create and innovations that they produce come at the intersection of people working across fields and departments. And so actually having moving beyond specialization is incredibly important. Uh, BCG many years ago created incentives uh, out of this because they realized people that actually lack specialization but knew just enough about a field and many, many other fields uh, were able to create huge gains. And so modeling this in schools uh, creates enormous 
uh, value that actually then carries over to real life in the future. And I think it's one that students, even if they can't explicitly tie to the institution, they implicitly realize that these habits of learning and these working across departments creates this nimbleness that you really need in today's world. And how are you seeing that on the other side um, with employers? Like how are you, or yeah, you in, in, at, at large? Yeah, in the workforce. So they're starting to realize it. Like I think if you had this conversation 10 years ago, and one of the reasons I think we over-indexed, frankly, on STEM uh, careers and so forth, was that people were so obsessed over lack of technical skills and you need science, technology, engineering, mathematics at all costs. And I think employers are starting to realize that actually there's deficits if they go too specialized and that uh, really their imperative in this economy is to create uh, growth that comes from unexpected places. And that only comes from the mixing and matching. And there's actually some really interesting experiments that even show so diversity of experiences on teams better than all people who are uh, specialized, hyper specialized, but actually diversity of experiences in an individual often trumps the diversity on teams, like having an individual that can literally be like, on the one hand this, but on the other hand from this other perspective that. And so building that intentionally into individuals uh, is incredibly important for uh, creating breakthrough innovations, which employers realize that they have. And I think they're starting to get wiser to the fact uh, that they have to move toward this. One of the challenges is I think sometimes HR departments are a little risk averse, but if you can actually get to the hiring managers and the people on the front lines themselves, they see this on the day to day. And so that's for, for students and institutions, uh, for colleges and universities, frankly, helping students navigate that process to realize get beyond HR, actually have conversations with the real people and the real jobs. Then you can start to see actually hyper specialization in the long laundry list of credentials within a particular department, maybe not the most important thing. Yeah, and I think it goes back to this, this question too um, around, you know, how do employers assess for, for these? You know, obviously industries are different um, and there are some, you know, where there are more traditional methods of recruiting, uh, you know, working on certain target schools, uh, working off a, a, certain, a certain type of resume, whether it be GPA or if you studied this thing, then you'll likely be a good fit. Um, you know, our experience at Kuru, we saw that there are certainly a number of employers who are really wrestling with this question of how do we uh, honestly take some of the bias out of our hiring and not just look at where someone went to school and what they studied, but really start to ask these questions around how do they show up in a team, right? How much emotional intelligence do they have? Um, you know, can they present effectively in different environments? Can they really wrestle with the ambiguity? Are they the type of person who's gonna figure it out or are they gonna show up at work and say, you know, I, I need a manual on how to do my job. Um, and I think that employers do that in a range of ways. So we've seen that um, certainly there are assessments uh, for soft skills um, that exist. Um, I think the, the great thing when we talk to students uh, about these types of uh, essential skills is that they are in fact things that you can get better at. You know, it's not something fixed that actually if you are one aware of what those things are. So I think part of it is actually helping students develop a different framework, right? That being successful in the world of work isn't about like just getting good grades and, you know, doing well in your course and being able to write good papers. It's actually about a different set of skills. Um, and the, the sooner that students uh, understand what those are, and then the sooner they have the opportunity to start telling their own story to say, okay, I understand that, um, you know, conflict management is really important, right? And let me think about the times in which I had to do that. That might have been with a roommate, it might have been on a sports team, it might have been on a project at school. And sometimes students don't see those examples as valid because they're really focused on their transcript and their GPA. Um, but if they can articulate those stories and share those, then often those are more powerful um, to an employer who honestly is, is looking at a set of candidates that typically look really similar and are probably saying the same types of things. Um, you know, Ollie, actually, I'm curious, while we still have you here, as you are thinking about those, those essential skills and those soft skills, um, how have you learned, because uh, I think you have, to, trans, you know, to translate that uh, so that you can 
uh, you know, not just catch the eye of an employer, but be authentic in your representation of um, some of those softer skills. Yeah, so I think that's still a work in progress for me, but um, I think it's mostly like during an interview in the stories that they ask you, well, you kind of have to make it a story, like when they ask you a time you failed or um, why did you choose your major? That's kind of where you highlight those soft skills, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, personally for me, like, uh, school wasn't easy the first few years. So I actually do have a story of saying, like, I had to overcome school being very difficult for me for many various, like, personal reasons. Um, and, like, I create a story of just, like, overcoming that and, like, having to be honest about that. I'm working on myself, asking for help, um, you know, relying on not other people, but just like working with other people so I can get through that. And I think that exemplifies teamwork, conflict mm -hmm. resolution. Um, and it's kind of about telling a story about yourself and marketing yourself is just not just a GPA and, you know, a cold resume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. And I think that that point of storytelling is really important. And we have found that a lot of students just don't, again, just have the opportunity to, to think about that and practice that and really just go through the exercise of, sure, I you know, solved a, a math problem or did a um, set of uh, problem sets, but really what did I have to do in doing that? And you're just asking that question of, you know, why was it hard? What did you have to come to? Um, and so, you know, I, I know that at, at Karun and Jason, we do a lot with students um, around that translation and, and helping them tell their authentic story. Um, the last idea here before we break for some dedicated Q&A time is around really um, how do we make this type of learning um, and make it more accessible to a broader set of students. Uh, certainly, you heard that refrain when I was sharing a bit more about Maya and Alex and Ollie herself shared a bit about that too. Um, you know, Michael, I know you've done a bit of work here as you think about you know, diversity of minds, you said, you know, diversity within somebody uh, as opposed to diversity within a team. Is there anything else you'd like to articulate here as we think about how we engage more different types of students in different type of learning? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the reality is I think companies are becoming much more aware uh, that diverse teams have huge benefits. There's a lot of studies showing ROI uh, improvements um, from uh, having more diverse teams. Uh, even Goldman Sachs now will not work with companies uh, for public listings unless there's at least one woman on the board. There are a lot of steps forward, I think, right now in this. And so for students, A, there's benefits to the, the diversity that the companies are recognizing, but B, being able to work with those teams is extraordinarily important as you're coming up as well to uh, acculturate, uh, sort of uh, build the cultural habits of what that will look like. And so I just think the benefits like from every single angle, justify creating more opportunities for more diverse students to come together uh, to, to tackle challenges, not just, again, in the classroom, but also connecting it to some of the other themes we've talked about, and in terms of real world problems and, and, and things of that nature. That's going to have huge benefits if you actually can start showing students uh, the, the, the benefits of it much earlier. Uh, and. and uh, help them see that it's actually valued. It's not something that's being preached, if you will, but it's actually valued by, by uh, parts of society more and more. Yeah, it's one of those things that's different. Like you can be their, their parent and say, it's really important that you learn this, right? And we all know that doesn't work. Um, but if they come to it on their own, it's, it's far more meaningful. It makes me think a lot about someone last summer, uh, the student, Nate, he said, you know, I, I came out of this and I, I feel like I'm more of a maker because I have these skills and I feel like I can build and break and build and break. And he said, but the thing that surprised me the most was that I actually feel like I got better at managing conflict when I'm on a campus. I do a project with a group of people and then I walk away and I have lunch or I go play a sport or I don't see that person for two days because that section doesn't meet and only meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I can kind of just get by, um, not actually addressing it. And he said, in, the, in a workplace, uh, which adjacent it really feels like work uh, because of the way it's structured, he said, I, I couldn't really hide. So I tried to do those things 
and it really didn't work. Um, and it kind of blew up in my face. And then I had to really address it because I knew I'd see that person for eight hours tomorrow and the eight hours the day after that. Uh, and to your point, Michael, it's this, this idea of um, this immersion and, and having to really problem solve makes you have that moment of like, oh, you know what? Someone did say that was important, but now I'm actually really feeling it myself uh, and taking some value from that. Um, so we would love to make sure we answer any questions that may be remaining. Uh, there's some contact information here and certainly um, you can also follow up with Megan if you can't get in touch with any of us, uh, but we would love to make sure we pause for questions. Yeah, and there were some great questions, and I think you got to the bulk of those that were presented in the chat. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear more about any tools that you are aware of that can help measure these quote-unquote soft skills and assess soft skills. Yes, so there are actually, and Michael probably be really well equipped to do this too. Um, I mean, there are a range of, if you th there is a, a great report around sort of technology and hiring, um, and it breaks out sort of the uh, sort of the workflow around hiring from like sourcing to assessing. And some of those skill, some of those technologies, and um, I can share it out after, uh, I think it's through Talent Tech Labs is the actual entity that, that puts it out. Um, but there's a bucket around assessment in that and they uh, do a range of cognitive, non-cognitive types of assessment to understand um, levels of competencies such as resilience or um, you know, self-efficacy, uh, things like that. Um, so there, there are a range of companies that do that. Michael, you may have other examples on the assessment space. Yeah, they, uh, just a couple that come to mind is, um, I would check out Ithaca did a really good report um, about six to nine months ago. Uh, Ithaca SRI, or excuse me, Ithaca Research, um, uh, where they spotlighted a lot of the pre-assessment hiring tools that are in many cases measuring soft skills. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good place to sort of get grounded in, you know, the pie metrics of the world and so forth that have emerged in this space um, to try to offer some of that. The other thing Anne said much earlier, uh, I think is true, which is a lot of these skills are still domain specific or at least uh, field specific, maybe not, you know, specialization specific, but at least in the field. Um, uh, and so, you know, some of this is making sure you understand the context in which you are asking the question. I always like to say Myers-Briggs, when you ask it in the context of your home life, is very different from your answers when you ask about Myers-Briggs in your work life. Um, and sometimes we, we've uh, treated it as, as sort of solid traits, things that are actually more domain dependent than, than they might otherwise appear. And so context matters, I think, for a lot of this. It's, clearly the case with, you know, grit and perseverance and things of that nature, that the context in which you uh, ask those questions can dramatically change one's answers, uh, depending on what their reference point is uh, when they go through some of these assessments. So that's the other piece just to keep in mind uh, as, as, as you sort of consider the set of assessments that are out there. Great, thank you. And Here's a question that came through from Monica. Given that specializing too early might put students at a disadvantage in a rapidly changing workplace, has anyone considered offering a degree without a major, one that teaches to the hard and soft competencies that are adaptable for future work? So I think we're starting to see more and more of these sort of bubble up. What are you seeing, Michael and Anne? Yeah, I feel like I've seen in, in conversation with a lot of institutions about more self-designed majors um, that aren't specific actually it, it you know sometimes a self-designed major is like oh I, you know it's actually these three majors i want to do so i'm just going to call it a self-designed mm -hmm. major do all three of them uh and it's really it's really not i, I think that uh, i was just talking to someone at university of new haven um they're developing this emergent studies department and students there are really more focused on the the skills that they want to focus on uh and then they can design the projects they want around that um so i think there's 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 some space, um, not within all institutions, but within some where there is less of a focus again on the discipline and the, the skills and projects um, that will come out at the end. Michael, anything to add there? 
Yeah, the, I, the only two quick things I'd add are um, Minerva, I think, has done some very interesting work in sort of rethinking domains that people major in and more making them rooted, actually, in many cases in these soft skills or, or critical thinking, creativity, and things like that, and some sort of having them as outgrowth of that. Um, and so that might be one thing to check out. You know, the, the other piece that, and sorry for background noise, the other piece that I think is interesting is uh, in, in my new book, I wrote about Wayfinding Academy, which has a degree in self and society, um, which is really about figuring out who you are as a person and what are your passions and interests. Um, so I think right now, just the point being, we see a lot of experimentation. My read on it is, again, you know, going through different fields is really important. Developing some technical domain expertise is important. And being able to combine these things and articulate them to employers and whatever the degree is called, we're seeing experimentation there. As long as it is combining intentionally those different experiences, there's tremendous value. All right, great, great answer and great background there. And our friend TJ, hi TJ, has a question in the question box, which is this overall approach seems very interesting and potentially powerful. What barriers to scale have you identified? Yeah, Mike, I'm going to let you start here because you've worked across more institutions uh, and programs than I have, but then I can talk specifically about the ones we've experienced. Oh, I was going to say you know this way better, uh, but, the, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll give a stab at it. Uh, so I, I think we're seeing, you know, um, just institutions being aware uh, of uh, faculty processes and what are they trying to develop on site, right, is like sort of the biggest one of uh, – as you construct a department or a major, it's often the sense that we should offer all the courses in it, or we should have a huge computer science department or things like that. When in point of fact, at a lot of institutions, you just, it, it's, it's very hard to have the breadth and depth that you need to stand up these majors in fast changing fields. And so being able to work, I think, with outside entities can sometimes feel uh, difficult for, for institutions, but, but that's, a, that, that's the biggest barrier that I frequently see. I would say, uh, you know, given the fact that you're working with, uh, you know, an, a, a regional uh, accredited liberal arts institution, a lot of the transfer concerns that you see in other domains like that have tried to mirror what uh, adjacent is doing have been challenged more when you're trying to transfer, say, from a community college to a uh, regionally accredited uh, tier one institution. Um, less the case, at least in my experience, when you're talking about a place like Davidson right. uh, or other dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment programs that I have seen, not just in this landscape, but more generally. And Yeah, I think that's fair. I think um, from our perspective, uh, how do I say this? I think it is absolutely true um, that when we work with students, we should have high rigor. There's no question about that. And some of the existing policies in place are designed to protect that, right, and to make sure that is the case. Um, and so from a, you know, values perspective, I would say we absolutely value that. Um, but I do think that sometimes some of the, the policies, as, you know, Michael has said, has, have gone in the way, and they're, they're just very institution specific. So um, to Michael's point about Davidson, it's a very well-established, uh, well-respected institution, um, and we work very, very closely with our faculty there, but there are some institutions that don't uh, take domestic study credit, you know, where they might take, um, you know, study abroad credit. Uh, and we've worked with a number of even college presidents who say, you know, we really want more study away domestic programs because not all of our students can go abroad. Um, but we have this policy in place where we can't articulate that credit, which is highly frustrating. Um, but it is just something that, that exists that we uh, need to work through. And so I think the, the scale uh, is, a, is a bit, we run into that barrier um, when we think about some of the institutional policies that exist, um, despite the feedback we get from students, which is extremely positive. So, you know, when we, when we launched Adjacent, we've seen really strong interest from students, but, and there are things that we need to do to, to make it possible for them. Well, hopefully with some changes to accreditation from the Department of Ed, there should be some more flexibility and adaptability. So it'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. And there's another question from Peter. Are there any adjacent academies planned for this summer? So maybe talk more about how that model operates and how institutions can partner with you, Anne. Sure, so I'm happy to talk more um, 
offline with people who are specifically interested in it adjacent. We really wanted to focus on the research and the students today. Um, but we operate study away programs uh, both in the summer and during the semester. So uh, we're operating one in the spring right now in San Francisco where it's the 16 week four course semester away uh, program. And then in the summer, we'll be operating likely two programs in San Francisco, where similarly students will, will move um, away, uh, do an experience, gain the skills exposure, and also the credit. Um, and then similarly going forward, we are working with a set of partners on other locations as well. Uh, so the roadmap includes not just um, different locations, but different types of courses as well. Terrific. Well, we have about four minutes left. Are there any final thoughts you all want to share? Uh, there, one more question before you jump in on your final thought is, there, here's another question from the chat. What is the or organization Minerva being mentioned? Michael, you had mentioned Minerva. Yeah, sure. So um, Minerva is the first elite liberal arts uh, college created in the last uh, 100 or so years in the United States. It's uh, uh, basically students rotate among uh, eight different campus sites uh, during their four-year experience. Uh, they have a, a very intentional uh, active learning platform that they develop so students are, are co-located but learning online actually in, in what's effectively the most uh, tiring yet uh, engaging seminar you've ever seen in your entire life. I don't think Full disclosure, I don't think I would have been cut out for it in my college days. Um, but, uh, uh, and uh, it, there's a great book about its design called Building the Intentional University that sort of peels back the layers of all the things they thought about to sort of reinvent the liberal arts experience in a very compelling way. And, and I guess the last thing to just give you a sense is the caliber of students they're accepting is already sort of an Ivy League set of uh, caliber. The, the selectivity, I think, is like 2% or something like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's an extremely selective uh, school that, that's gotten its start, um, but I think it, it actually has a lot to teach about how you might design a liberal arts if you're doing it from scratch today. Terrific. Okay, any final closing thoughts? And I'll let you, uh, I'll let, uh, do you want me to jump in with one thought? <laughs> And then let you. Sure, I, was, I was just saying, uh, I would just say that, um, you know, this is a complicated space, you know, and, and it's about, you know, as, as we talk to a lot of different types of institutions there, I would say that there's already an awareness about the opportunity, right? It, it's not that, um, you know, institutions are hunkered down thinking, oh, you know, we need to protect the liberal arts and it's this constrained space. Um, but there is an awareness that there's value in the liberal arts and uh, we need to support students in uh, being exposed to other opportunity and that it's really around how do we make that more possible, particularly for students typically underrepresented in technology. So, you know, we're thrilled to be working uh, with institutions who are excited about that opportunity uh, and uh, supporting many students in doing that. But again, it's, it's complicated. I, I wouldn't say that um, there's an easy one size fits all solution out there. Uh, and we appreciate that there are people who are trying on as we share these four different ideas. Like it's gonna take a little bit of, of everything um, to get to the place where we can serve all students well. Terrific, thank you. And I agree, I think it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in education because even as slow as we evolve in higher ed, there's a lot of really, really interesting momentum and in work. So I think that we're gonna see more in terms of experiential learning and to see a resurgence in interest in liberal arts education. So I wanna thank both of our presenters and our fantastic student, Alexandra. I know that you're gonna do amazing things and we look forward to kind of keeping tabs on you. It's always wonderful to remind us of why we're doing this work and it's students like you that help reinforce that we are in the right work and that I shouldn't be a park ranger, part-time or full-time. So <laughs> I wanna thank our WCT supporting members and our wonderful sponsors that help underwrite much of the programs and events here we do at WCET. So if this was your first WCET webcast, do get on our website, follow us on Twitter. We have a fantastic blog that our communications director updates two to three times a week. So we put out as much good information as we can to help really move the field of higher education forward. So thank you all for your wonderful questions and your participation, and we'll see you at the next WCET event.
Thank you, Anne, Alexander, and Michael. Take care. Thanks, Thank everyone. you so much. Bye. Bye.